fellow dropouts. From lifestyle, fitness, beauty, travel, relationships, and self-care, Steph's got you covered. Welcome to your safe space, where you can stop what you're doing, relax, and let someone else do the heavy lifting for once. This is the Luxury Dropout Podcast with your host, Stephanie Joplin. What's up, fellow dropouts, and welcome to a special Christmas episode of the Luxury Dropout Podcast with me, your host, Stephanie Joplin. I am so happy to be celebrating Christmas this week with you guys or however you celebrate, whether it's with friends, family, on your own. This episode is for you because I have a world-renowned celebrity therapist with me today in Marissa Peer. Marissa is a best-selling author, speaker, podcaster, YouTuber, and has been named Britain's Best Therapist by Men's Health Magazine. Marissa has spent over three decades treating a client list that includes people like Olympic athletes, huge celebrities, CEOs, and of course, royalty. She's been covered in outlets like the Daily Mail, Red Magazine, Elle Magazine, Marie Claire Magazine, and was listed in Britain Tatler's Guide to the 250 Best Doctors. Needless to say, she has the credentials. Today, we talked about some hard-hitting subjects that often pop up for us during the holidays with regards to triggers and perhaps feeling lonely, not having your person during the holidays, also being mindful of other people and understanding that maybe they don't value Christmas like we do and have a hard time with Christmas, coming, especially coming out of the pandemic. That's huge. We're so used to being alone in our space and maybe not wanting to go out and just like being more mindful of that and how to spot that in our friends and family. Another topic we cover is the new year, New Year's Eve, new year, new me, your new year's resolution, for example. We cover all those subjects and more. We also talk about Marissa's trademarked therapy method called RTT or Rapid Transformational Therapy. She has written a new book that's coming out in January of 2022 that I got to preview and read and I did cover for this interview called tell yourself a better lie. And so we got a chance to peek into a therapy session with Marissa. And as a special bonus, at the end of this episode, Marissa will lead us in a meditation to find, attract, retain a love in our life, a great love in our life. And if you already have a love in your life, this is a great meditation for you as well, because you are picturing in your mind, you're manifesting all of these good vibes that come to you and make your life abundant. So let's get right into it. I would like to introduce all of you to Marissa Peer. Well, Marissa, welcome to the Luxury Dropout. I am so pleased to have you on today. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, my pleasure. Um, so I want to start off with um, all of my listeners who who are tuning in. I want you to focus in on Marissa's message that I am enough. And I want you to repeat that out loud to yourself before Marissa and I begin speaking, that I am enough, you are loved, you are enough. And that is the mentality that I want you to absorb all of this information with um, while we discuss. So uh, Marissa, let's start with a little holiday FOMO, as I like to call it, or fear of missing out. Because, you know, here we are, you know, probably in the grips of the holiday season already. It's barely December. And we're expected to have holiday cheer and to have smiles on our faces. And many of us aren't aware that there are, you know, people suffering with triggers or, um, you know, the holiday season makes them extremely sad. Um, Can I ask you, how can we be more mindful of those around us, loved ones or friends with triggers, how can we perhaps spot those um, and and make things more comforting for them? Uh, Are are there any indications usually? 
Yes, you'll find that you think some people are antisocial, or shy, or difficult, or self-contained, but they're just not used to company. You see, this is the weird thing about the mind that we should all be taught in school and we're not. The human mind is hardwired and super coded to go back to what's familiar. It loves what is familiar. And it really doesn't like what's unfamiliar because that's what kept us alive. You know, many years ago, we lived in a fort. We didn't go, well, you know, I'm really bored. I think I'll go and hang out with those native Indians over there because familiar was safe. That's why if you have a two-year-old child, they only eat what they know. Imagine if you lived out on a prairie and they could wander off and pick mushrooms and berries. They will only eat what they already know, and that's how they live. And so the problem is when, when the first lockdown came, I remember I did not know what to do. For three days, I didn't know what to do with myself. I was like, I'd lie on the sofa and read. I kept falling asleep. I was like, oh, this is so boring. And then I got so used to it that now it's like, I've got to go out. Oh, no, I like staying home. I don't want to go out. And recently, somebody sent me a voucher to go to a restaurant. I'd done some work for them, and I took my two friends. I thought, oh, you know what? I actually much prefer having dinner in their house or my house or their garden or my garden. I now found restaurants so noisy, and I got so used to being quiet, being at home, pottering around. Eight o'clock, so, oh, time to sit on the sofa and watch television. It's like, go out? That just seems unfamiliar and that's what it is it is unfamiliar of course if I went out every day it would become familiar in the same way that every year we go oh it's winter it's so cold <laughs> we get used to it. oh it's summer it's too hot and we get used to it but a lot of people haven't yet got used to being social they have social anxieties like getting on a plane oh my god look at all these people there's too many people sorry I'm banging the thing there's too many people the virus mm. is everywhere we have to accept that people aren't like us. You know, my mother used to always say at Christmas, it's so unfair because you and your kids and your brothers, they all get on their phones and I don't have a phone. I don't have an iPad and she felt very left out. And it's, it's like having in-house jokes or, you know, yesterday I had some friends for dinner and we all sat and watched Succession. Said one who'd never seen it, so, no, it's cool, I'm going to sit on my laptop and do some work we kept saying Marissa how much though would this family need with you so even though we'd never seen it before he was very graciously joining in but the opposite of that is making someone watch a movie that they don't want to watch expecting someone to get your in-house jokes expecting someone to understand all your traditions expecting someone who really likes quiet time to be in your wild family or someone who likes wildness to be in your oh we're a very quiet family we, we don't do that you wouldn't expect a vegan to tuck into bacon and turkey and sausages. And you wouldn't expect someone who loves me to be thrilled about your nut roast. You know, we, we try to adapt people's diet, people's tastes. And I think it's just about being a little bit aware of just because I love it. Do you love it? You know, it's like people with children who with children don't hear the noise. We had people stay with us with three kids who I call the wildings. And the level of noise was extraordinary. But they didn't even hear it. And their kids would eat strawberries and then just throw the, the stalk on the floor. It's like, wow, I would never let my kid do that in my house. But they're different. They believe in wild parenting. I don't know what it's called. It's the name for when you let your kids do whatever they want. What's that name for that parenting? Is it the, like a Montessori type of mentality no it's more i call it wild parenting your kid can do whatever they want whenever they want uninhibited parenting i guess and you mm -hmm. never you never give them any guidelines because they're learning that way but you can't force that on someone else and as parents i found that we all had our own parenting stuff, but we kind of understood oh you know i might let my kids eat oranges on the sofa but my friend is curling her toes at that mess. I might let my kids have candy for breakfast and drink cans of soda. In fact, I wouldn't, but someone else does. And, you know, when you, you send your child to someone's party, you can't say they don't eat sugar, they don't have soda, they don't have cake. You just have to go, well, will it hurt for a, an afternoon? So in the holidays, you just have to be aware that not everybody likes what you like. Not everybody loves what you love. They're all very different. And we have to accommodate other people because they're not like us. And if they were, you know what? That'd be the most boring thing ever. If everybody was like you, you'd be bored out of your mind. It's people's differences that makes them our teachers. 
Absolutely. I, and I agree with you. Uh, you know, anytime someone invites me out now for an evening out, I say to myself, but I like it here in my cave, <laughs> you know, it's different, but of course, once I'm out, I enjoy, uh, but it is different from, from the lockdown. I mean, I spent so much time with myself. I got to know myself very well. <laughs> so Me too. <laughs> so speaking of the same along the same vein, not having your quote unquote person for dates like Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve. Now that is something that I personally put out there that I struggle with. And I don't know why, but those are really that in my birthday are the only dates that I typically find myself crying at some point. Uh, usually it's later at night. Um, and I have a very loving, attentive family, but my sister goes home with her husband and her children. My parents go home and then I'm in my home by myself. And sometimes I think, oh, poor me. That kind of mentality is the what I am used to having. Of course, now I try to put my thoughts into a better pattern of more positive speaking into the universe yeah. and things like that. But what, what would you advise someone who comes to you and says, Marissa, I don't have my person. I'm so sad. This is supposed to be the, the best time of the year, Christmas time, but I don't have my person. I don't feel complete. What do you say to them? Yeah, well, I would, I understand that because, you know, we all hear about this person completes you and you found your other half, but you're not half. You're not half a person without a person. You are not incomplete without a person, but every song, every radio advert says, you know, Christmas is for sharing, Christmas is for giving, Christmas is about being with people all wrapped up and hugging each other. And if you're alone, that can be very hard. And then you have to come back to reality. Christmas is a day. You wake up. I mean, I would say if you're on your own, do not have television on all day with all the adverts. Try and have something on like a Netflix series that you're following. Make some yummy food just for you. Buy yourself a gift and unwrap it. But the best thing you can do is go and find someone else who is alone too, but particularly an old person. I remember w w talking to one of my mother's friends once. He said, on Christmas Day, I have no one to say happy Christmas to, no one I can wake up to say Merry Christmas, no one to say good night to, no one to have a gift with. And if you can get into that giving mentality, oh, poor me, I'm not, I don't have my guy or my girl, but if you can find an older person, a lonely person, a sick person, and go and spend some time with them, you feel amazing because you realize how great your life is. I used to take my daughter every Christmas to feed homeless people. You know what was so great is by the time I came home, I felt like a billionaire, like walking over, wow, I've got a sofa, I've got a bed, I've got heating, I've got food. I felt so incredibly wealthy because I put myself around some people who had nothing. We would give them gloves and a torch with some batteries, and they were so thrilled to have that. And just finding a neighbor who's alone, or maybe a single mother with lots of kids who just love someone to come in and play with their kids, or maybe someone it's cold and you could walk their dog, or there's always something. You know, my neighbor is kind of alone with cats, and I bought her some cat advent calendars and took them. And she was so, that little tiny thing just meant so much to her. And it's often little things that we do that make a huge deal to someone else. So rather than sit at home thinking it's not fair, everyone's having a good time, everyone's got gifts and family but me, go and be someone for someone. And, you know, your problem is someone else's, but there's someone somewhere with their mother, their mother-in-law, their aunt, their grandmother, their kids, their kids' friends, their kids all standing, God, I would love an afternoon to myself. Uh huh. You might be having their fantasy Christmas. You get to indulge yourself and do whatever you like. And there's many, many Christmases in your year, in your life, in your calendar. You're probably going to have 90 of them. <laughs> you have one bad one, it doesn't matter. Just learn what you should do the following year. Like I have a friend who's a hairdresser, and every year on Christmas Day, she goes to a shelter, she washes people's hair, she cuts it, she says it is the highlight of her year. She could be sitting at home with her kids, having a lovely dinner, but she loves that thing of what can I do for someone else? And there's always some, there's always a shelter 
someone feeding people, there's a program you can join and you'll have camaraderie, you'll be around people and don't think, mm, that sounds really not fun. It's probably, it, it's actually great fun because you're with people, like-minded people doing something that matters. Oh, that's, that's a lovely idea. Um, for those that do have family or someone to say happy Christmas to and spend the time with, but then they go home and then are sad that they don't have that person laying in bed next to them. Um, how do you flip your mentality at that point in time? Do you just run through of what you're grateful for or what, what do you recommend? Yeah, I mean, the great thing is if they're on the same time zone as you, you can prop your iPad on the pillow and you can still say goodnight and you can still see their face and mm -hmm. just put yourself to sleep and wake up in the morning. And again, it's always about you have a choice. Yep. You can talk yourself into why things are terrible. You can talk yourself out of it. I'm on my own on Christmas night. I don't have my person to wrap their arms around me. But next year I will, this is the last Christmas like this because we can only learn from something. Whatever's going on this year, I'm gonna learn from it. Did I say to that person, I want you to be with me? Did I offer to come and be with them? Did I say, look, it's really important to me. In fact, it's a deal breaker that we spend this time. Or did I just kind of assume? And now I've realized because I didn't say anything, they're spending it with their family. You know, when something goes wrong, you have to learn what happened that was wrong and fix it and learn from it because everyone assumes that everyone's having a great time. Yeah. Maybe there's a party going on and you never said to the person, hey, is it okay to ask, can I come? I'd really like to come. They think, oh, no, I couldn't possibly invite myself. Well, you have nothing to lose by doing that. Mm -hmm. The option is sitting at home thinking, I wasn't invited. <laughs> As long as people think they invited you, maybe your invite went missing. People have said to me, I, can I come? I'd love to come. And I never said no. I admire people who have the courage to go, hey, somebody rang me up and said, hey, uh, can I stay in your spare room? And I was a bit affronted because I didn't know what And I, I said, I've already got someone staying. They said, I know, but you've got two rooms. Can I have the other one? It's only for one night. I'm leaving. And I said, okay, you know what? You can stay. But please don't expect me to cook dinner. I'm busy. I'm out. So if you have dinner and then come, you can stay. And I didn't really want them to stay, but as it happened, it was great. I had a lovely time. Wow. Because I had my own boundaries. And so did, and I kept thinking it's only a night. They're going to turn up at 9.30. We'll go to bed at half 10 and they'll be gone when I wake up, which they were. So it wasn't a big deal, but I really admired that person for having the chutzpah to say, can wow. I stay at your house overnight? I hear you've got another spare room and I'd like to have it. And I went, yeah, why not? You, they really said, oh, you have another one. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. That was funny. Well, it was an, there was an event that was on and some of them that event was staying with me and she'd said, oh, I'm staying with Marissa. And she said, oh, I want to stay with her too. I'm going to ask if I can have the other room. <laughs> Next time I'm in your neck of the woods, I'll say, hey, is there other spare room available, Marissa? <laughs> yes, of course. So new year, new me, right? This, this mentality of, you know, we have to start out the new year with this rise and grind hustle mentality. And I personally, I'll speak for myself. I think that is such a toxic mentality, very toxic um, in my opinion. And, you know, the social construct around, you know, the early bird gets the worm. And if you don't wake up at the ass crack of dawn at 5 a.m., then you don't really matter so much. Um, can you talk a little bit about your opinions on that? Do you know, my best new year, last new year, I was in London. It was just a, after lockdown and my daughter and her just beyond gorgeous fiance made dinner for me and my husband. We were like, this is so nice that they want to make dinner for us. That's all shit. And we went over and I had the nicest I've ever had. I've been to schmaltzy New Year's, eight star New Year's, banquets, mm -hmm. parties, red carpet events and this was my favorite new it was just me and my husband her and her husband to be they cooked dinner and we had the nicest time ever because it was so simple but it was so meaningful that that's what she wanted with all the places she could go and that's what we wanted with all the places we could go I think new year the pressure to have a great time and amazing I remember one year I just actually moved house I took, put my cruising out. I, I just watched um, a home decorating show all night to get out, and I just pretended it wasn't New Year. And in the morning, I thought, well, that's all over now. And it was actually one of my, it was a good New Year because I just pretended it wasn't happening. So, New Year's Eve is a big hype and it's 
really just have a nice dinner with people. Don't go to a restaurant and spend hundreds of dollars. Just have a nice dinner with people you know or people you don't know very well, or again, go and help someone out. But on New Year's Day, this belief that it's a new year. Yes. Never eat sugar again. I'm out of bed at five. I've done the plank. I've done 20 yes. lunges. I've done my meditation. I've made some organic celery juice. It's not normal. It's not normal. When you set yourself as something that perfect, you can only fail. Nature will not allow you to be perfect. We have what's called an Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. Nature doesn't let you be perfect. And perfect people are the unhappiest. They're also the loneliest. If you have done the plank, done your lunges, done your squats, done your meditation, drunk your celery juice and cleaned the house by 6 a.m., you will not have many friends because you make them feel inadequate. Mm -hmm. And I think the best New Year's resolution you can ever make, ever, ever, ever say, this is the year I start the day going, I'm enough. I'm enough. If I want to spend the day in my pajamas, writing my book without even combing my hair, it's cool because I'm enough. If I want to wake up and not do a workout because I feel like I've got a little cold and maybe I shouldn't be out going for a run, it's okay because I'm enough. I believe that I am enough is the only resolution you ever need to make. I'm enough. If I'm enough, I don't need more. I don't need more cake more macaroni cheese, more praise, more people. It's when you think you're not enough that you need more. And then you think, you know, who am I trying to impress with this perfect life? We don't really like all those people who turn up on YouTube showing you how they make pancakes out of mung beans and how they never eat chocolate, but they make their own chocolate out of fermented Brussels sprouts and <laughs> with cow because... And, and they always look perfect. You think, no, I don't really, you can't, you see what the basis of a friendship is we choose people who share vulnerabilities. That's what gives you a friend. I like you because you're like me. We like each other. And people who appear to be perfect don't have that vulnerability. They're usually very, very lonely. And so be glad that you're a real person. You see, the truth about you and me and everyone on this call is this. We are flawed people. And we're going to have a flawed relationship with other people who are flawed. You know what? That's a wonderful thing. When you appear to be perfect, you won't have friends. And then we look at people like Britney Spears and Lindsay Lohan and watch them fall apart and think, oh, I, I thought they were perfect. I thought Elizabeth Taylor's life was amazing. I feel better watching you. <laughs> because if you can't hack it with everything you've got, I feel okay and I've given me permission to not feel so good either. So we love vulnerability. Mm -hmm. When you hide yours, bury it, fake it, you might have glowing skin on your diet of no sugar, no carbs, no gluten, no alcohol, but you won't have any friends. And what's the point of that? Wow, that's a harsh reality, I think, for for so yeah. many. Um, and my my dietitian, the my nutritionist, I should say, she talks about intuitive eating, and that's what I really love about her. Because I'll t I'll say, Nicola, I really messed up. I ate I ate a piece of chocolate cake, and she's like, "Well, did you enjoy the chocolate cake?" And I said, "Yeah, love I, I loved it." She's like, "Then you didn't mess up," and I'm like, "Oh, that makes sense." So you know, when you want to eat, you need to ask yourself three questions. What does my body want? What do I want? What does my mind want? Because the mind wants all kind of crazy stuff like triple cheesecake and triple chocolate junk ice cream because the mind believes it will make you happy. Mm -hmm. What you want is something different. Oh, I want just to have mung beans and a green juice. What your body wants is the is the question. What not my mind, my body my body never wants jelly beans and and chocolate cookies and glazed donuts my body hates <clears> that <throat> that's my mind and what I think I want is well I want whatever I, want. I don't want to be difficult I don't want to be the one who says I can't eat that it's full of sugar but when you keep saying what does my body want if you say hey my do you know what? I really do feel like some chocolate my maybe, maybe I'm tired and that will give me a bit of a lift you know last week I was in Mexico and I felt like an allergy, and I, I don't drink juice, but I had like a big glass of precious grease orange juice because it was like a liquid antibiotic, and I, right. I needed it that day because it needed vitamin C. 
Right. Well, I wouldn't choose to have a big glass of juice because I don't think juice is particularly healthy. In that moment, my body, if I was super like, you know what, I think I'm going to have a coffee. My body needs that now, but it's not your mind and it's not you just getting what does my body want. And if your body wants a piece of cake, enjoy every bite, savor it, enjoy it, love it. Don't think, oh, I, I crammed that in full of guilt, ate it so fast, and now I didn't even taste it. I need more. Right. Now I feel guilty. Really, but you know, I'm loving this. This is absolutely yummy. I love every bite. Yes. Just be mindful, like you were saying. You know, just be savoring. Say to your mind, you know what? Burn all that off now. That's your job. Your mind metabolic rate. Just use it, burn it off, and it will. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I um as a as an aside, I, I will tell you I am struggling very much um right now because I was in a really terrible car accident um on June fifteenth and I'm unable to even do something as simple as bend forward to pick something up. I'm trying not to get too down on myself, but because I have physical limitations, and I'm sure you've worked with many people with those physical limitations, what can I do every morning when I get up to say, hey, it's okay to get out of bed and not be able to go to the gym today, and you will get there? How can I motivate? Well, we have to use a magic word. This too will pass. You know, Sophia Loren stayed in bed for nine months with each of her pregnancies. She literally had to lay in bed. And she said, I've stayed in bed for four years. Don't say I didn't. I wanted a baby so much. That was the price I paid. So you've got to lie in bed for nine months. I paid the price. I didn't complain. Mm -hmm. I felt very lucky that I could have a baby. And I think we can cope with anything when it has an ending. You can cope with pain. Like, it's like giving birth when you know it will end. When I was giving birth, I used hypnosis. I think, you know, ha I remember saying to my doctor, is this the worst it gets? Yes. And how long is it? This is going to last for about another 90 minutes and then you'll have given birth. Okay, well, if this is as, as bad as it is, I can do it. We can cope with anything when it has an ending. It's like yes. people on remand do worse than those acceptance. <clears throat> So when you know, okay, my dogs are going to take three months before I'm, I'm active again, but maybe in that three months, it'll come back slowly. If you can see the ending of this, you're okay. Because for something to get you, it's got to be called PPP. It's got to be permanent, which means it's going to happen every day for the rest. It's going to be all pervasive, which means it's going to go on all the time. Mm -hmm. And of course, while you're sleeping, you're not thinking, gosh, I can't lift weights because you're sleeping. So if it isn't permanent, it isn't, or if it's not personal, it can't hurt you. It can bother you and frustrate you, but it will pass. So you have to think, okay, what's the longest it's going to be like this for? Visualize when you're lifting again and think of all the things, hey, you know, I've always wanted, one of my clients actually went to jail for tax fraud. He said, I always wanted to write a book. When I was in jail, I thought, well, I've always asked for this time. <laughs> he wrote a book in jail. She also became a Pilates instructor. She took um, the certification because she had the time. And so I'm not suggesting you do that. But when you can't go to the gym, what have you always wanted to do but said, I don't have time to read that book, write that program, learn that language? You've been given. This podcast is exactly yeah. what I've done Maybe with the time. time. <laughs> you can't go to the gym, but you can use that time. You know, yeah. Who was it that was locked down in play, the plague and and discovered the theory of relativity? It wasn't Einstein. It was someone who developed that. You know, you're a smart girl. You're a smart, attractive, amazing girl. There's something, when you look back and you're age, you think, wow, I had an extra two hours a day, and this is what I did with it. I invented something, created something, birthed something. So yes. rather than think it's so, un you know, I had bursitis years ago in my children. I used to always also love weights and, yes. and I couldn't do anything except lie on my front with my arm hanging down the side mm -hmm. of the bed to try and get that bursitis to go away. But I wrote a book during that time because that's the only thing I could do. So mm -hmm. you'll look back one day and think, yeah, you know, I had a time many years ago when I lost a very much wanted baby and the person who I was with left me. And then I got fired from a job I had on television all at once. And I'd never had depression, but I had something like that then. Mm -hmm. and, and I wrote a book on 
how to get pregnant, how to stay pregnant. And it was great success. And I look at that book and all the babies born. I wouldn't have written that if I hadn't lost a baby, lost a relationship and lost a job, literally like a house of cards. But because I was so sad, I couldn't do, I didn't want to go shopping. I didn't want to go to the gym. I didn't want to go out with friends. I just kind of was retreating. And the only thing that worked was to get lost and consumed by writing this book and then later I thought wow that was a good thing that happened because I wrote that amazing book and you will too just think of what you can birth create and birth in the hours that you can't go to the gym and do it now because in no time life is so quick you'll be back in the gym thinking I wish I hadn't spent those hours just watching Netflix I could have done something creative Yes. Well, I have channeled it definitely into this podcast and I've been doing a lot of work on that um, since the accident for sure. But you're right. I, there's always something else I can be putting my passion into but as well. Isabel, you know, her marriage has ended. Instead of sitting at home going, she's written an amazing album all about Beautiful. It. I think, wow, Adele felt a failure. That makes me feel a bit better because I feel a failure. But if she feels a failure looking like that with all that money, She's giving me permission to feel. I just love, I love her. I I just love her. You know, when you listen to her talking about how she was so lost and she felt like a terrible mother and, and, but she's just a person, but you see, she's saying, Hey, I'm flawed. And guess what? So are you. Let's be flawed. I love Adele. Yeah. We'll be flawed. We don't have to say, Hey, I'm perfect. You're not. We like people like her because she's sharing her vulnerability and helping us use her vulnerability to get over ours. And so you can use your vulnerability for three months. Maybe you can't lift. What can you do? Just sharing that story with people is helping them say, well, you know, I'm pregnant and I can't even see my feet. I've got a sick baby. I can't leave the house. Um, I've got this disability, but you're making me think, could I do here that would be amazing? So going, this actually goes into, into very well question that I was going to ask you a little bit later, but I'll ask it now because it's appropriately timed. When someone like you, who is the foremost expert, the best known therapist, the celebrity therapist, the one that everybody goes to, the one that you have to be on point all the time, Marissa, that you do not get to have a down day. What happens when you do have a down day and when people misjudge and and say that you have to be perfect, right? No one's perfect, as we said. Um, what do you do? Who do you go to when you need a helping hand? Are, th- are there some self-soothing techniques that you use? I would love to hear about them. And if you'd be so kind as to be, you know, maybe give like a specific example that's as of late that you've gone through. If I have someone attacking me in the press or being mean or horrible or something, you know, like all of our business went through a lot of stuff in COVID, like everyone else's. One of the things is I give myself permission to what I call take the day. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years ago, one of my friends, dear friends died. And I remember I just lay on the sofa and watched this whole series all day. Um, I think it was Pride and Prejudice. And I just escaped into that. And I said to my husband, I'm feeling really sad. And I'm just going to lie here and get lost in Jane Austen for the whole day and do nothing at all. But the thing with doing that is you cannot do that and feel guilty. I could, I should be doing this. I, I give myself permission to do nothing. I say, I'm like a battery and I'm recharging here. And if I'm going through sadness, a loss of a friend, uh, someone has died, I allow myself to really sit with that sadness, to really miss that person but also to get lost in something. I think you have to give yourself permission. You know, if we go back in time, when people were in mourning, they would wear black. They they would say, at home, people would visit them and they'd all cry together. And they understood that humans need to go through their suffering and you can't speed it up. You know, there's a song called, You Can't Hurry Love. Well, guess what? You can't hurry grief. Oh, my dad just died and I went straight back to work and I just carried on. My husband left and never told a soul. And three days later, a breakdown. Well, of course you had a breakdown because you're suppressing your feelings. Your feelings, here's the magic. Your feelings are the most real thing you have. And you must feel your feelings until they no longer require to be felt. 
When you Netflix your feelings, eat your feelings, shop your feelings, Amazon or eBay, your feelings, <laughs> or Healy, your feelings, they don't go away, they really come back stronger than ever. And so whenever I've had sadness, of course I've had sadness. In 2016, my mum, my dad and my best friend all died within three months of each other. And that oh was my. hard. Um, I mean, it, she was one of my, she wasn't my best, she was one of my very best friends. And they all died. And that was hard. And I, I would have to feel that pain. I couldn't get rid of it. I couldn't think, well, I just shove that in a drawer somewhere. There must be some chocolate somewhere that can take away the pain of my mum and dad dying. You know, my mum and dad deserved me to feel pain. I loved them very much. And then I was dealing with my daughter's pain at losing both her grandparents and my sister's pain. And the only thing you can do is sit with the pain, sit with it. What is the pain telling me? I love this person so much, I miss them. And then eventually I, I would have better days, but you can't get rid of that. We know, I don't know who we think we are. We go, oh, I don't feel grief, I just carry on. No tribe does that. Even animals, you know, elephants, when someone dies, they go up and they look and they, they express their grief. And so I think if you're feeling pain, Grief, sadness, loneliness, hurt, rejection. You have to sit with it and think, what am I feeling? Will this feeling, am I going to feel this feeling every day for the rest of my life? You know, when my daughter had to start a new school, but she started that school in the middle of term. She said, mommy, I'm, I don't have any friends. I said, darling, you know, this is your life today. It's not your life, it's just, and you're gonna have so many friends, you're a great kid, so it isn't your life, it's just your life today. And it might be your life tomorrow, and it might be your life next week, but it's not your life. Your life is so many friends, and so many people, and it's a bit like when someone you love leaves you, and I know waking up, look at me, think, oh, you suddenly remember that pain that you've been dumped or abandoned or replaced. And it is a horrible feeling, but it's not forever. It actually does go. You'll meet someone and think, oh, my God, am I ever glad that that idiot dumped me? They did me the biggest favor. Yes. I think of this that to me and I think, wow, please never write to me again. You did me the biggest favor ever. You don't need to apologize for becoming a, being a complete ass because I'm glad you were. Yeah. You got a perfect ass. I didn't ever need to actually go out with one as well. So <laughs> you actually helped me out. I, God gave me a great ass. I didn't need a second one in my eyes. <laughs> and um, at the time it was painful, but now I look back and think, wow, well, I dodged a bullet there. I was talking to my daughter who's getting married saying, wow, you, you really dodged a bullet with that last one. And thank goodness he was such an idiot. <laughs> mean and horrible and selfish because... Look who you're marrying, the nicest guy in the world. Oh, It doesn't feel, seem like that at the time. At the time, we feel heartbroken. But when someone leaves you, here's the thing to remember. Everything they loved about you, everything they said, they didn't pack that in their suitcase and take it out of the house. It's still in you. And they went, oh, you're the best. You're the sexiest, funniest, most compelling, most amazing person in the world. They thought that once. It's still inside of you and someone else is going to find it and like it more. And when you, you can't make someone stay, you have to let them leave with grace and realize, wow, if they don't love me, I'm better off without them. Who wants to be with someone? You've got to earn their love, chase their love, work for their love. So it isn't easy when you're left when you're bereaved, when you're dumped, when you're fired. And all of those, I've been fired, I've been dumped, I've been bereaved, I've been left. But one day you look back and think, you know what? It's okay. It, it isn't permanent. You just have to sit with it. Someone said it's a bit like drowning. The wave comes over your head, but then eventually you think, oh, I'm coming up for air here, and this is just a little wave, and now I'm actually making it to the shore. I'm feeling a bit beaten up, but it's okay. You come up for air. And while you're in that time of grief, you should stay in bed eat jelly beans, watch stupid stuff on television, whatever gets you through the night, it's all right. Don't go to the gym if it's not your thing. Don't go to self if you don't want to. Don't make yourself organic broccoli. If you say, I really want to sit with a box of seeds candy, have a box of seeds candy, whatever helps you 
deal with your feelings is okay, but you must feel the feeling until it no longer requires to be felt. Get rid of that feeling. And when you feel the feeling, it goes away so much faster than when you deny it. The magic always happens when you sit with a feeling and, and just feel it. Yes. You know, Shakespeare said, and it was sort of out of pain comes art. Every great movie, every great song about is written by someone who's been through heartbreak. I'll never find love again. I can't live if living is that movie, The Light Between the Oceans and Rust and Bone and all great literature comes from heartbreak. Nobody says I'm having such a brilliant life. I think I'll write a novel about it. Yeah. So maybe something great, maybe some great art will come out of your thing. My daughter has a site called Turn Your Broken Heart into Art. And she does a lot of broken heart art. And it's pretty cool because she learned that all those sad feelings, she can turn them into art. I'm going to look that up. Turn Your Broken Heart into Art. Yeah. I'm going to look that up. Actually, her website is just called Fade Repair. Okay. But um, she's got a lot of broken heart art and I love it. Oh, that's beautiful. I'd love to meet Phaedra. That sounds amazing. So that's a great segue into RTT, which I I want to tell you that I've read most of Tell Yourself a Better Lie, which is going to be coming out in yeah. January of 2022. And what, uh, what did I think of it? I First of all, it was mind-blowing because I, I knew what RTT was in general sense, but I didn't know the deep dive and the meaning behind it and what exactly the process was. And and I loved reading the individual stories as well of patients that had come in with various afflictions and traumas and how different they all were. And I, I really resonated with, um, I can't remember her name, but it was one client who on the outside, she appears completely fine and without any problem. And then you get a little bit more and a little bit more and you realize, oh, there's a lot of stuff going on under, underneath, right? When you peel back the layers. And so I had a, it caused me to have a conversation with my parents. And cause I said to myself, well, I can't think of anything in my childhood that was bad. Like my childhood was great. I don't know, mom, dad, like, did you notice any weird behaviors? Like did any weird repetitive things? Cause I don't, I mean, you guys were the best parents ever. My, my mom's from London, by the way. And my dad is from Alexandria, Egypt. So they're both, you know, um, immigrants here. Yeah. And so, um, you know, they, they just surrounded me with so much love and care. Um, and then my mom told me, she was like, you know, when you were born, you came out screaming, which by itself really is fine, normal. Yeah. But then they noticed when, when, when they put you in the nursery, they noticed that I was on one side within my cot and on the other side were all the other babies. Cause I was just, I could, I would not stop screaming. And then fast forward to about three years old. My mom said that I had like a complete meltdown for like hours for no apparent reason. And I am diagnosed with generalized anxiety. And I didn't know what that was until I self-diagnosed much later. But she's like, I should have kind of had an indication back then that you were just worried about things for no reason. And by doing a lot of work talking about my grandmother, we have discovered that it was likely related to, to her depression and anxiety. But yeah, it just like it, it caused this beautiful conversation between my parents and I um, after I read the book. And so I just it was an inspiration and trying to explain to them what RTT was, was really cool as well, because they, when I said it's a type of, it's like a guided meditation, it's hypnosis. They immediately were like hypnosis. And I said, I want you to stop right there <laughs> because it is not the type of hypnosis that you're thinking. There's like this negative connotation with hypnosis sometimes that even as you mentioned in your book, that therapists place traumas in your past that weren't even there even before. Um, can you talk a little bit about why, and I know this is in your book, but just briefly to cover, why is RTT different just from hypnotherapy? 
I think RTT is a client-based therapy. A lot of therapies are supposed to be for the client, but often they're for the therapist. You come in every Wednesday for three years, and that gives the therapist a lot of security. Spend a long time just getting to know each other, and then for the therapist, I don't feel bad if it doesn't work because it's a long process of building up trust. But no one goes to AE and says, hey, i just broken my arm. I know I've got to build up trust before you can set it in the glass. Now I go to the dentist and go, my tooth's fallen out. How much trust do I need to build up with you before you um, fix the pain? I love I love that. How you said, I'm not going to go turn up at the ER and the yeah. doctor says, hey, let's wait three weeks for you to yeah. trust me and then I'll treat you. I'm build a relationship. And I understand the relationship. I really do. But when people are in pain, they don't have time to build a relationship. You know, I was in New York. In 2000, I went in an anapoleptic shock. Out of the blue, that never happened before. And my poor sister and husband were just absolutely terrible. I was unconscious, so I was fine. <sighs> but then they got an ambulance, and I, and I don't remember the guy who shoved an EpiPen in my leg. I just remember waking up in a hospital saying, oh, I'm fine, I need to go home. I didn't build any trust with him because I think my eyes had rolled up into my head <laughs> and my mouth was like a puffer fish. Oh, no. I only had, had a few minutes before I wouldn't breathe, but I was using hypnosis all the time to tell my body, look, stop making antihistamine. It's histamine is fine. It's just a part of me. And it did help me a lot, but I never even met that person in the ambulance. I don't know who he was or what he did. There were, I guess I had to trust him, which is easy when you're unconscious. <laughs> I think it's a shame that we say you've got to build trust over time. And, you know, you've got to come and see me for years and years. We are in pain, whether we're in pain because we've got a broken leg or a chronic migraine or the love of our life has left us and we don't know how we can take another step forward. It's all pain. I've just lost a baby. Uh, I have irritable bowel, so I can't go anywhere. I, I, I go bright <clears throat> speak to me that's all a degree of pain and our job is to get people out of pain as fast as we possibly can so rtt is an amazing um method because first of all the therapist is like a detective they're gathering information because they oh i've never been able to leave it well we know that isn't true i've never been able to be the center of attention no nope. babies leave food and the first thing that happens is people look at you they count your fingers and toes they look at you no one says don't look at me I've got no hair, no teeth, and I'm yes. covered in spots here, and I don't look great, and I'm totally naked. You know, babies just lap up attention because they think they're worth it. So most of our presenting problems, are, I'm not confident. I don't feel worthy of love. I, I can't leave food. I can't go after the job of my dreams. That you were not born with any of those. You acquired them. So RTT starts to look for what went on. Where did this happen? What was going on? And when it's found the information, what it finds, usually in the first 15 to 20 minutes of a session, it then starts to interpret, oh, this happened, your dad left when you were one, or you didn't have a dad, or you were the only kid at school with glasses, or only poor kid, rich kid, whatever. Mm -hmm. How did that affect you? <clears throat> let's look at how you interpreted those events and then let's interrupt them. And then finally we become a coder and we put we take out the old stuff and put in the new stuff because most of our pain is actually caused by the lies we tell ourselves. I was put up for adoption. How could I ever count? I should have been a boy and I was a sixth girl. I don't mean anything. I was working with this amazing girl just last month, a Chinese girl who said, you know, my dad died and I'm nothing. I'm just a girl. I said, but you're not nothing. You're everything. And by the end of the session, she, it was really amazing how she really believed everything. And I met a lady said, my life in three weeks has changed so much. I've got a boyfriend. He adores me. Wow. Said, I'm not nothing. I'm everything. So oh, we just beautiful. tell ourselves, I don't count. I'm not tall enough, smart enough, rich enough. But, you know, then look at Kim Kardashian. Why is Kim trained to be a lawyer? She's beautiful. She's wealthy beyond her wildest dreams. She's got four gorgeous children. But somehow that's not enough. She's now doing something which I really admire her for. She's doing something that makes her feel this, is, this counts. This is something worthwhile. I'm mm -hmm. saving someone's life possibly and i really hope she does that guy who's on julius jones yeah julius mm -hmm. jones 
And so if she needs to do something valuable with everything going on in her life, then we understand that we need to feel that we matter, that we have a purpose, that our life has meaning mm -hmm. and is significant. And one of the reasons I love being a therapist, there are many, is because it meets all my, I feel significant, I feel connected. I make a difference, I contribute, I'm growing all the time, my life has meaning and purpose. And I created our TT really to give clients what they need, but also to give therapists what they need. And we've won tons of awards and yes. you don't need to go to university, you don't need any background in therapy to train with us, you just need to have a love of helping people. And it, I think it's the best job in the world, I love it. Well, something that I truly, truly resonated with that you start with the premise, the client can always help themselves. And mm. I think that is, it gives me goosebumps because it truly makes you think about the fact that if you can tap into your power, you can achieve anything that you want. And if you need a little helping hand along the way, then that's okay. But I like that you kind of guide them to the responses instead of saying, well, were you abused as a child? Or did this happen to you when you were little? Instead of doing that, they are giving you the answers. And I think that is what people are so scared of, you know, hypnotherapy and, and people putting ideas in their heads, but this is not what you're doing. This is completely patient guided meditation, essentially. And you're just, yeah. you're helping them to pull it out. And also when a client, when I'm working with a client who says, you know, I'm 400 pounds or I've got contact dermatitis or eczema or I've got an autoimmune disease, I would say, you know, do you know how powerful you are that you could make your body weigh 400 pounds, that you could create contact dermatitis, that you could create an autoimmune disease? That's power. You can give yourself, every time you think of going to work, you go to migraine. Every time you think of doing some task, you, you suddenly get a terrible headache. That's power that you can make your body create these symptoms. And if you can create it, guess what? You can uncreate it. Because if you had the power to turn up with these issues, which you created, you didn't know that, but you did. You also have the power to stop having them ever again and to have better ones. Yeah. And I think it's a question you have to ask yourself, like, is is your 400 pound weight serving you in some way that you secretly aren't thinking about? Like, is it maybe you're, you don't have to do certain things because you weigh 400 pounds that like, that's why your brain created the space for you to have an autoimmune disease or develop, um, did your, you know, your, your brain, like you said, like your brain was able to create that because maybe it serves you in some way. Yeah, your mind is always tuning in. And when you say things, I give anything to get out of that meeting. Oh my God, I, I do anything not to have to give that talk next week. Your mind's going to come up with something like an ulcer or chronic diarrhea because no one's getting on stage and giving a talk with chronic <laughs> diarrhea. No one's getting on stage when they can't stop sneezing and blowing their nose. Suddenly they've got the worst cold ever. Yep. And if you think that's to way out, you mean that your mind can create physical, well, what do you think blushing is? If you blush at a thought, you're, the, every thought you think creates a physical reaction. Your stomach rumbles when you think of eating, you blush when something's, your eyes fill up with tears when you say something emotional, and you get very physically aroused when you think of something sexual. So every day, Thoughts become real. Our, our mind creates a thought, but our body has no choice but to make that thought real. And that's incredibly good news when you realize, wow, I can think good thoughts and they'll become real. Of course, you can think bad thoughts and they'll become real. Every guy I meet ghosts me. If I look at a cake, I gain a pound. <laughs> Cats don't like me. They always hiss at me. But you can change it to a uh, I'm magnetically lovable. The next guy I meet is just falls in love with my very soul. I can eat cake and my body burns it off. Cats, they love me and I love them. All you have to do is understand your words shape your reality. Don't like your reality? Look at the words you're using and change those. Someone said to me, you know, I, I heard you talk and what was so amazing is I've had painful feet for 10 years and I've had so much work on them. And I realized, what do I say every day? I can't stand it. 
I can't stand it when my husband never picks up his pants. I can't stand it when the kids never put the jar on the feet. I can't stand it when no one puts anything in the trash here. I can't stand my boss. I can't stand my neighbor. She said, it was just amazing how much I used that word and I stopped. And within a week, my feet have never hurt since because I wow. didn't know what I was saying. Oh, that's incredible. And it is amazing that so many of our issues that we do, do not want to have. Like I was always late. For, if I had 10 hours to get somewhere, I, you could guarantee it would be late. One day I realized it was because my dad was my principal, my head teacher. Yeah. And I got his attention by always being late. And the minute I worked that out, wow. I knew that it just stopped overnight because kids don't notice this is good attention or bad. It's just attention. Mm -hmm. You turn up late, everyone turns around to look at you. It's horrible, but the mind doesn't decide. I give you, it's like watching your kid have a meltdown in the store. They don't think, hey, I want good attention. If you say, I want to be noticed, you might end up with explosive gas. You'll definitely get noticed now, but that isn't what you wanted at all. No. But be very careful what you ask for because you were powerful enough to create what we ask for. Yeah. The issue is, what are you asking for? You want money? How much? You want love? With who? Some crazy guy that's never going to call you again? You know, make sure, be careful what you ask for because you'll probably get it. When you ask for what you want in a very relevant, appropriate, exciting way, guess what? You'll get it. It's like the genie in Aladdin. You have to be very specific. <laughs> yeah, this is the genie. And yes. your wish is it's come out. If you say, I do anything... But if you say, if anyone, if I got dumped like that again, it would kill me. You might, I'm going to turn you into the most cold hearted bitch in the world. No one's going to dump you again. Yeah. You know, I worked with somebody once who said, you know, I was bullied at school and I longed to stay home and never go to my mum wouldn't let me. I asked her if I could not go to school. Don't be ridiculous. And then I got this hypersensitivity to ultraviolet light where I burned if I went outside. And guess what happened? I couldn't go to school. But now I'm 42 and I've still got it and I'm living in my flat as a coach and I'm miserable because I can't go out. So I asked for it when I was eight. And when I was eight, it was so seductive to stay home, watch cartoons, eat strawberry yogurt out of the fridge and have a great <laughs> time. But 40 years later, I'm longing to go out and date and socialize and just go to a store, but my skin burns. So I feel yeah. like a vampire. I can only go out at night. And in the summer, that's hell for me because it's still light at eight o'clock. No. But that's what she, she didn't know she asked for it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I want my mum's attention. I'm always sick. Now I get her attention, but right. I'm still sick and my mum's dead and I'm still sick because I asked for it. Oh no! But that's, it's not bad. It's and it's not to say that anyone said, "Hey, I want to be sick." Of course, my mother was evacuated in the war, and she was so ill that her mother mm -hmm. came took her home. And my mum learned at a very early age: if you're ill, it suits all your needs. And she never really gave that up. But she was a great teacher to me because my mother loved being ill. I've never seen anyone light up in hospital like she did. Do you think she was being taken on around the world cruise? That's my grandmother, hundred yeah. percent. But it, yep. it suited her, it served her, but she just never learned how to change it. So we ask for something when we're little. If I'm sick, mommy doesn't go to work. If I'm sick, daddy isn't going to leave mommy. If I'm sick, my parents stop shouting immediately. And that's fine because a child's mind is very different to an adult. The difference is when you're still asking for that 40 years later. Mm -hmm. And so we just have to understand that we have the power to create this stuff and we definitely have the power to stop it. And the power to stop it is amazing, which is why I created RTT. Yes. And I, I want to read, I'm going to paraphrase from your book. And um, if in January, listeners, please pick up a copy of this book because it is incredibly powerful. But I'm going to paraphrase my favorite quote from the book, which is, there is nothing you can control except your thoughts. When you change your thoughts, it changes your life. Yeah, right. and you see, it's, it's like the domino effect. I use my fingers to show you. Your thoughts dictate your feelings. Your feelings dictate your actions and your behaviors, and you justify it by going back to your thoughts. And we're so busy thinking, oh, I don't feel lovable. I'll get some things cut off, snipped off, injected in. I'll, I'll do something to find. And we're trying to change your behavior, 
or an action or a feeling change the thought. Yeah. Thoughts control everything. Feelings follow thoughts. Behaviors and actions follow feelings. But you have to change the thoughts. So imagine if you wake up and think, I'm, I'm not enough. That's a thought. That will make you feel sad or angry or disabled or powerless or helpless. And the actions, remember, that will be no action, inaction or you know, procrastination or self-sabotage. If you change one word, I am enough. Now you feel, oh, I'm enough. I can take a risk. I can ask that person out. I can ask for a pay rise. I can start my own business. I can look for a partner. And now the behaviors and actions have changed entirely because you changed a thought, which changed a feeling, which made you take risks and go out there and do something. And so it really is about understanding you can't control your body or you'd never get sick. You can't control the weather. You can't control the traffic. You can't control your kids. You can't even control your baby. But you can control your thinking. When you control your thoughts, your life changes so dramatically and so yes. amazingly. And that we all have to really aware of, well, my thoughts are mine to change. I own my thoughts. I can upgrade them, up-level them. And then my whole life is going to change because I changed my thoughts. So changing, I'm not love or drop. Who's going to love me with um, cellulite and a, a kid? Well, loads of people, by the way, hundreds of people. When I, when I, my little girl was little, I was a single mom. People said to me, wow. I remember this guy talking on the plane going, your daughter's so engaging. She's so amazing. She's so engaging. And, and he actually talked to me because of her. I had one guy who loved my daughter every bit as much as me, wanted to take her on and be her dad. It's easy to say, oh, well, who's going to want me? You know, I've got children. I So it was Heidi Klum. She seems to find someone else. It, it's who's going to want me? I'm not perfect. You know, Piff Rosman's wife. Kelly is very far from, he just adores her. Sting's wife, Trudy, has got a scar all the way down her face. Doesn't make any difference at all. If you decide you're lovable, you will be lovable. Well, in the spirit of taking risks and being vulnerable <laughs> and giving the universe a sign of what I would like, I, I understand that you were going to lead me in a little bit of a meditation. So I, I, I don't even know what to say. I'm so excited. Originally, the safe road for me was, oh, I'm, I'm so close to tapping into my power. And, you know, I'm, I'm starting to manifest things and, you know, things that I've asked for have to come to pass. So what, you know, what can I do to just knock down that one little, you know, window or door that's left to get there. And that's like the safe route. But for me, what it really is opening my heart um, and letting all of that good feminine energy come in and kind of like letting go of some of the masculine energy that I have to accept love um, from a potential partner because I've been single for quite some time. And um, I, f I do find repetitions in my relationships and without putting out into the universe, you know, speaking, you know, every guy does this, every guy does this without saying that I do, I do find patterns. Um, and so I'm like, I have so much love to give and I'm ready to, um, give, you know, give love and receive love. So that's where I am. And that's a meditation for vulnerable. you everyone in the audience who either wants to find love or wants to dramatically improve the love they have. And in fact, in February, we're releasing a brand new course in how to just in how to be a love coach. We're doing one in Jan and how to be a weight loss coach, but in mm. February we're gonna do just how to just be a love coach. So nice. if you want love, here's the thing: love is not to be chased or earned, it is not to be worked for, it's not to be bought. There's only one thing you need to have to find love, and it is to believe you are lovable. To really wire in, it's got to be real. You can't go, yeah, I just fake it. You've got to really believe with every fiber that you are worthy of love and deserving of love, and that the kind of love that you want wants you. So I'm going to do a three-step meditation. The first thing is going to be wiring in that you deserve love and are worthy of love. The second step is, and it's interesting, is, what does it look like? And so I don't know. I just want some great guy with a six pack. But then you meet them and think, like one of my friends that always wanted a really rich guy. I've got a rich guy. I never realized how ruthless he was to be as rich as he is. And he works all the time. I never see him. I, and we don't go anywhere because he's always working. And so I didn't realize that 
maybe a less rich guy who loves the family is what I want. So really be aware of what does it look like? What I made a whole list. Yeah. What values <laughs> they have. But when you've got the list of what you want, then you would think, well, what I want, what do they want? You know, maybe I've found this amazing person who's busy, busy, busy. Perhaps he doesn't want someone busy. He might want someone less busy. Maybe, you know, what I want, I, I've got to make sure that what I want also wants what I want. So imagine you want four kids and you found someone who doesn't want any. You love to travel and your person has to stay home because he's head of a company and he gets two weeks holiday a year. You want someone who's a vegan and loves animals and the person you found is a hunter. I mean, that's all going to be a bit weird. So you've got yeah. to be clear that you're on the same page. And then the third step, and this is so important, I don't know if you'll miss it, is what are you going to do to find it? People say, where, where are you looking for love in my yoga group? Are there any men in there? No. Well, there's one. <laughs> There's the teacher. Well, you're not going to find love in a yoga class. You need to go in the weight room. There's loads of guys there. You're not going to find love in your woman's book group or going walking around a boutique. But maybe if you went to a golf club or a poker school or a mastermind event or an IT event, you would find a guy or a girl. So you've got to think you're worthy of love. What do you want? And what you want, where is that person? They might be walking dogs on the common, but they're probably not wandering around Zara looking at silk shirts because women particularly are very bad at knowing what they want. They might just go to a bar, but there's loads of people in a bar looking for love. You're far better to go into the weight room, to go to a, go to poker school, go to a car wash on a Saturday morning and read car magazines. It's full of guys. Think, wow, this girl is a real motorhead. You, you, I told one of my clients to do that. She was married in a year. She went to this car wash in Chelsea, full of guys with amazing cars, and she always <laughs> read car magazines. She said, oh, I'm just a Porsche head. You know, and she found a guy who also loved Porsches. She didn't even have a Porsche, but who cares? And then okay. I'm very happily married because you have to, you know, if you want a house, you go and look at a house. If you want a job, you go and look. People say, I want a love. I'm staying at home. Well, you're only going to meet the Amazon delivery person. He's probably not your ideal guy. <laughs> because that's the only guy knocking on your door. You've got to go out and find it. When you know you're worth it and you know what it looks like and you think, I'm going to go out and get that. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I found my husband at my daughter's school. He was another parent. And that was a lovely thing. I mean, I knew him. We, I was with somebody and so was he. But 10 years later, we met. We were married within 10 months because wow. he's a real family person and very funny. And I knew what I wanted. Funny, kind. Kindness is so underrated as a quality. Funny, kind, smart, but also free to travel because I'm on the road all the time. And everything I wanted, I got with bells on because I knew what it was. I knew I deserved it. And when I met him, I knew that he had all his qualities. So let's begin. Yes. I'm going to ask all of you to just do, for this is a nicer meditation that I created. There's lots of them on YouTube. And it involves you, first of all, you're going to be touching the area right in between your eyebrows. And you're going to impress by making little indentations. You're going to impress upon yourself what you really, really want. And then you're going to call it in by opening out your hands. Then there's a little voice that goes, oh, you're not going to have that. You're not a size triple zero with two half grapefruits stuck on your clavicle, so that's not going to happen to you. <laughs> and when you hear that voice, you can move from side to side or even put it on your thumb, and you're going to erase the negative and download the positive. So very easy, just follow along. So first of all, close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, just practice Breathing in and breathing out. I want you to take a breath and then give that breath away. And then take it back and then give it away. And there is a balance in your life of giving and receiving. You can't take a breath and hold on to it. And you can never give a breath without taking more back, but you can try now. So try just breathing in, just take, just be a taker. And keep taking and taking and breathe in, take more breath in and more breath in. 
Keep inhaling for the next four minutes, but do not exhale. Just take and take more and take more and take more until it feels uncomfortable and indeed unnatural. And now give that breath away, exhale. But this time I want you to be a giver, a real giver. Give all your breath to everyone else in the universe. Don't take any, just give and give. Keep exhaling. Because you know you can do this for four minutes. Just give that breath away. To everyone else, just keep giving and giving. And only when it feels uncomfortable and unnatural can you take. And then go back to the balance of giving and taking. You take a breath, give it away. You give it away, you take one back. And that is exactly how it is with love. Love is about giving and receiving. It's not about earning, chasing, working. It's about being worthy of giving and receiving love. So as you continue to give and receive a breath so perfect, I want you to take your first finger and your middle finger and just touch the area in between your eyebrows. And I want you to impress upon yourself that you are worthy of love. You are deserving of love. And I want you to repeat some statements after this, but keep your eyes closed and keep that little pressing going. You're impressing, instructing, installing the truth about you. I want you to repeat after me. I am lovable. I am lovable. And everyone, I want everyone in the audience to do it too. I accept myself as lovable. I accept myself as lovable. I easily accept the love that is all around me. I easily accept the love that is all around me. I'm filled and nourished by the love that other people have for me. I'm filled and nourished by the love that other people have for me. And I fill and nourish other people with my love. And I fill and nourish other people with my love. I'm worthy of love. I'm worthy of love. I'm deserving of love. I'm deserving of love. I'm absolutely lovable. I am absolutely lovable. What I want. What I want wants me. Wants me. What I'm moving towards. What I am moving towards is moving towards me. Is moving towards me. I'm moving towards the most amazing love. I'm moving towards the most amazing love. Because I'm worthy of it. Because I am worthy of it. I'm deserving of it. I am deserving of it. I'm ready for love. I am ready for love. Love is ready for me. Love is ready for me. With your eyes closed, just open out your hands into that absolutely receiving position. I want you to call in the kind of love that you want. And I want you to first of all see it. What does your ideal love look like? I want you to see your person. Your person, you are their person, they are your person. I want you to see yourself growing an amazing relationship together, loving and believing in each other. See yourself doing the most th simple things like making a dinner together, putting a tree up together, doing the gardening, building a home, holding hands when you watch a movie. But you need to really see what an amazing relationship looks like. Maybe you hike together, but if you hate hiking or kayaking, don't see that. See what your perfect relationship looks like for you, someone who loves your very soul. See it, really get an image of what does it look like. And secondly, what does it feel like? What does it feel like to go to bed every night wrapped up in the person that you love? You're sleeping in their arms. They are sleeping in your arms. What does it look like to have someone that has your back? They remember you. When you walk in the door, they can't wait to greet you. 
they do things for you and you do things for them. What does it feel like to have someone that puts you first, that thinks about a million little ways to make your day better? And what does it sound like when that person tells you every day, wow, how lucky was I to find you? We found each other. You're perfect for me. You make everything worthwhile. I want you to see it, feel it, hear it. Hear that person ringing your phone just to hear your voice, dialing you just to say hi. Feel that person always there to greet you, always there to talk through a bad day, to share the good times and to help you through the bad. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like and taste like? And smell is important. You now, if you're a girl, can imagine you have all those male deodorants around. And if you're a guy, you've got that wonderful smell of your girlfriend's hair or skin or products. Maybe you come home and your husband, your partner, your person is making dinner. Maybe you wake up and eat to the coffee that they make just for you. So what does it smell like and taste like? I want you to use all your senses and call in. Call in, code in, wire in, and fire in what it looks like. You wake up every day with a warm body next to you. You always have someone to talk to. You come home to someone and you share your evening together. You make plans for the weekend. You do stuff together. Again, what does that look like? Feel like, imagine every time you write an invitation. I remember the first time I had a baby and a person. I thought, well, this is so nice. I'm now writing my Christmas cards. Love, love from Marissa. And my partner's name and my baby's name. I thought, wow, I'm not single anymore. What does that look like when suddenly you're talking about we? You have two cups on the drainer, two toothbrushes in the glass. You're buying stuff for two or maybe three or four. You're signing stuff from two. Maybe you now have a joint account, but you certainly don't need to. But I want you to really activate every feeling Someone stroking your hair, holding your hand. What does it feel like? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it taste like? What does it smell like? And when you know, call it in. Call it in, code it in. And while you're calling it in and coding it in, of course there's a little voice going, no. That's not going to work for you. When you hear that voice, and by the way, it is your voice. It's not some rogue voice coming from anywhere else. It's your voice. So I want you to, first of all, put that voice on your thumb and turn that voice into Minnie Mouse or Donald Duck or Tweety Pie and laugh at that voice. It's so high-pitched, so silly. Then I want you to just rock from side to side, two inches to the left two inches to the right, and I want you to erase, eradicate, eliminate, end limiting beliefs, blocking beliefs as you sway from side to side. You are shattering, smashing, ending, erasing, eradicating, blocking thoughts and limiting beliefs. You're letting them go. They are shrinking fading, disappearing, they're out of your mind, out of your body, they are out of your life now and forever. Now I want you to put it all together because I want you to know that you can do this every night, five minutes when you're sitting in bed at night, five minutes when you get up in the morning, when you're on the train or in the back of an Uber, when you're sitting at your desk, even in the bath. Even in the shower, you can do this. I want you to take those two fingers again, touch the area in between your eyebrows and impress upon yourself what you want. Impress, install, instruct by telling your mind, I want love. Repeat after me what I 
require for myself is. What I require for myself is. My person, the person that I build and grow an incredible relationship with. My person, the person that I grow an incredible relationship with. And again, repeat of me, what I require for myself. What I require for myself. What I insist on for myself. What I insist on for myself. What I give myself immediately. What I give myself immediately. Is attracting my perfect person into my life right now. Is attracting my perfect person into my life right now. And growing and building an amazing, loving relationship together. Is growing and building an amazing and loving relationship together. And then open out your hands and call in what that looks like for you. What does it feel like? Maybe if you're a runner, you go running in the snow, but maybe you think, I don't know, we, we lie in bed and watch movies in the snow. You know, some will say, you know, I, I want an athlete, but I'm not athletic. I want someone who loves cooking, but I hate cooking. So make sure you're getting this right. What does your person look like? Do you like public displays of affection or you only like that behind closed doors? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like? Are you wildly social? You two, or do you just need each other? Are you out partying all the time? Or are you just happy together, staying home by the fire and curling up with a book or a movie? Do you love having people over? Or do you love shutting the door in the world and going, it's just you and me, babe? What does it look like for you? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like, smell like, taste like? And please don't try to find a carbon copy of you. That's really boring. Your person isn't like you. They're your teacher and you're their teacher. Again, what does it look like if you can see it? You can make it, if you can feel it, you can activate it, you can hear it, you can activate it. You need to imagine someone in your bed with you, the space in your closet, in your bathroom, in your kitchen, the best of, and you adapting to their world and they're adapting to you. And as you're seeing it, coding it in, wiring in, firing in, calling it in, any doubt, just move from side to side, just shatter, smash, erase, eradicate, eliminate doubt. You see, every pot has a lid. You're someone's lid, and someone is your lid. And love doesn't require perfection. It just requires you asking the right questions. What is my person like? What kind of values do they have? What are their interests? And then here's a question, where are they? They might be in the park exercising their dog. They might be at a rally, raising money for Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth. They might be at IT, or they might be in the gym. But when you know where your person is, when you know that you are worthy of love and you know where your person is, all you've got to do is put yourself right in front of them and you probably end up going home with them. You can find love at the school gates, in your office, in the street, in an Uber, in a store. You can find love anywhere because it's all around you. It's fully available to you. When you know you're worth it, when you know what it looks like, and when you can go out there, put yourself around the kind of person you want to spend your life with, and you'll be spending your life with them in no time at all. So know it, feel it, call it in, activate it. And for the rest of your life, you can imagine now I've got that person. What does it look like to keep this, to have an erotic sex life when you've been married for four years and you've got three kids? What does that look like? 
Because if you can see it, you can activate it. So you can find love, maintain love, and keep the spark alive forever when you know what it looks like. Know you deserve it and are worth it and are prepared to do whatever it takes. So knowing it, feeling it, believing it when you're ready. Just open your eyes. Take a deep breath. Just come back into the room. Whew. How does that feel? Um, great. Good. I was I started crying midway through, but it was That's good. That's really lovely. Thing. Good. Yeah. Actually, I want somebody with a six pack and a perfect body, and they forget that they might require that you have a perfect body too. And I want someone who's real partier. But you know, when you have children, that's what happened to me. My little girl's dad was a wild partier, but. When I had a baby, I didn't want a party. I wanted to stay home, and I wanted him to stay home too. And he's the kind of go, hey, let's go to Germany for the weekend at a moment's notice. Let's just fly to go take the car and go to Amsterdam. It's like, well, I got, like, diapers and a baby and changes of clothes, and I, no, I don't really think that's a great thing for her. And then they're in school, so it's like, I want to be with a rock star, but I know so many rock stars. I said, when your kid goes to school, you you can't do that. And when it, actually what was great seems, it, it's horrible. I don't want that. I want somebody normal. Mm -hmm. you know, my my brother was a football comedy. He loved football. And his first wife said, you've got to give all of that up now. I want you to go shopping with me on a Saturday for groceries. And that went horribly wrong. I bet. I went with him to the football and said, yeah, you know, this is kind of fun. I don't think she really loved it, but she pretended to put on her hat and scarf and sit in the muddy field because she understood yeah. that she had to get into his world just as he got into hers. And sometimes we just make a mistake about saying, you know, my perfect person is going to stay home with me or go out with me. And, you know, we look for someone so unsuitable. Like, I love bad boys I like crazy people I like and why well you know I was someone who said I, I want a gay guy that I can convert why well then I'll feel worth it well why don't you start from feeling worth it what's the point of having a gay guy when you don't even have a penis I mean how's that ever going to go anywhere you want a guy who likes men to fall in love with you Stop changing, change the beginning. You only want that. You think, wow, if I could convert a gay guy, I must be lovable. Well, why don't you start with, um, I could convert anyone I'm so lovable. I'm just going to start with someone. So that song, make it easy on yourself. <laughs> you know, if you, if you want someone to give you all their time and you find a single dad with four kids, that's not going to work. You have to, you know, I know people who've taken on a dad and I'm so lucky. I, I never had kids. And I've, I'm one of my friends, her husband's four kids came on their honeymoon. She's like, they're amazing people. I was blessed with children. I thought I'd never have them. But that would be someone else's idea of hell. I know a friend of mine, her, I don't know, he brought his children on the first date. Oh, in the world. And they weren't easy kids either. They had behavioral problems. And he said, oh. well, you want to be with me? You've got to be with my kids. That went wrong. And I said, now, so he said, I can't find it. I said, stop taking your children on dates. And when you're on a date, I've got to go home now. I've got to be bedtime with my babies. Even though you've got a nanny living in the house, oh, I've got to bathe them and tell them the story. I mean, unless you've got someone who really wants to be your kid's mum from the beginning, that's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> True. And then he found somebody with a handicap child. That would be a good thought. Well, that would be work perfectly. But her kids didn't get on with his kids. Mm -hmm. You know, be very careful. You can definitely take on other people's kids. It can be the joy of your life. But if you don't want that, don't pretend you do. Don't pretend you love running and watching sport when you don't accommodate it. My husband loves watching really weird stuff about the history of the world and. I don't love it, but I do my own thing then. But be honest, and then you'll find it, and it will find you. Thank you. And I have just one more question for you, and then I'll let you go. This is something I ask all my guests. Um, if you were to be walking down the street and you saw 20-year-old you walking towards you and you got to run to her and give her a warm embrace and as you parted you know as you left her embrace as you left her hug what is the one thing that you would say to 20 year old marissa i think 
I would say you don't have to try to find love. You're going to find so much love. You're going to have a great husband, a great child, everything you want you can have, but don't worry about it. Don't look for it in all the wrong places. It's not in a nightclub. <laughs> it's not in a bar, but it, you'll find it. Just in, And I would say the same thing as I said to my daughter, your life today is not your life. It's just your life today. Your life now at 20 is studying, a subject you don't like, going to a college, and but it, this is just your life today. But darling, it's not your life. Your life is amazing. You just don't know it yet. Wonderful. Marissa, I can't thank you enough. This has been so enlightening and lovely, and I have enjoyed every moment. And thank you so much for the feedback from my book. That meant yeah. so much to me. I'm so glad you liked it. I wrote that to help people realize that you can have it all with bells on if you just tell yourself a better lie. Yes. And that, I think that's a message I needed to hear. And I know that that's going to resonate with everybody else. So thank you. And thank everyone thank else too. Let yeah. me know how you, the book, and I'm actually doing a podcast called Lie with Marissa. I'm going to interview the 10 people from the, in the book first really someone else whose whole issue is about the lies they've inadvertently told themselves so that will oh. come very soon oh how wonderful oh how, that's so neat so when when is that coming that's in oh, after the same time as the book first okay. week of january okay first week of january i'm gonna have everyone look forward to that as well i'm Maybe going to mark my calendar marissapeer.com or rtt.com is where you can find out about the book mm -hmm. and how to want to be on live with Marissa just turn up and we'll have you as a guest per oh I love that yes all right darling cool. yes Anything Marissa thank Take you care. so much okay bye-bye love bye bye-bye bye -bye. well dropouts that was quite the episode of course as you know I was in tears at the end of our guided meditation but happy tears because I was able to really put myself out there and create this very vulnerable space. And I hope that you were able to do the same with the silence on my end and me not talking during that part of the sequence, but I hope you're able to manifest and speak as I was speaking those affirmations. And I just want to wish you the most beautiful end to 2021. I hope that this journey with me this year has really helped and brought you something, at least one piece of information that helped you in some sort of way or touched you in some sort of way, because that is my only mission is to spread knowledge, power, joy, love, spirituality. You know, if I could hug every single one of you that listened and supported the podcast, I would. I'm so grateful. So please if you are watching on YouTube, go ahead and like and comment and subscribe. Don't forget to hit that notification bell so you don't miss an upcoming episode. And if you are listening on a platform that allows reviews, please do leave a five-star review. It is so much appreciated. So until next time, I'm sending all my love, stay safe, and I will see you very soon. Mwah. That's a wrap for this episode of The Luxury Dropout. Make sure to visit stephaniejoplin.com to find all of Steph's episodes, including full podcast descriptions and photos of her guests. Until next time, besties.